Well, today's Tuesday, April 3rd. And Krista is off on assignment this week. We I couldn't guess. come up with anything funny to say that she's doing. <laughs> we shouldn't be overly mean to her because then we'll anger the social justice warriors and then it'll just turn into a mess. Well, I'm not being mean to her. I'm just saying. No. <laughs> she ate a Tide Pod. I don't know. It's like the, the Tide Pods disappeared. Oh, the Tide Pods are not in the shot. Oh, how could this happen? No. It's like level one production. Production quality is tanking. Today's a weird day because we're going to have an extra video today. There's a thing happening later, so it's going to be some technology news. So I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't mess too much with the news analytics. We'll see. But we're we're actually we actually are driving driving higher engagement with our little experiments. But we're still doing experiments with the new format. We still, I don't know that we still we still got our rhythm exactly the way that it should be. But I'm rambling, and we need to get on with the news. Tesla's Stock has plunged again as questions swirl around another fatal accident for Tesla. So we've got a we've got a story here. They didn't update it though with more information. They actually did get the they did get the black box, and so they said that the fatal uh, accident autopilot was engaged. However, the driver's hands were not on the wheel, and this isn't the first time this Tesla has been involved in an accident. It also took them a long time to come out with this, and I wonder if that was difficulty extracting the information because the severity of the crash i think the batteries burned and it was a very terrible crash it was uh this guy was taking uh an off-ramp and hit that divider the that, concrete that divides on. the ramp and the road <laughs> well we say he did it but it was actually the car because he wasn't driving he so was he was the car didn't really know what to do the uh was it was it dumb and dumber it was one of those movies where a car was driving along and it totally bisected the car and just split it in half. It's kind of like that. The guy was taken to a hospital, but he died at the hospital from his injuries because it was really, really severe. I mean, it's a sudden stop. You're colliding with a concrete barrier. There's, it's the worst possible kind of collision. So, of course, you know, Tesla, their stance on this, they made a statement and they're saying, well, yeah, sure, this was a fatal accident, but what about all those times that it wasn't a fatal accident? You know, it's... <laughs> And maybe there's some truth to that. You, you know, you never, you, you don't know how many times autopilot saved a life. You only know when it failed spectacularly. But in the, the shadow of the Uber debacle, this spooked some investors, I think. Yeah, and that definitely affected the stock prices. Um, although it does not appear, there's, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that there's any kind of real flaw with the technology. So. I think the flaw is, and I think Tesla can somewhat be blamed for this, people are overconfident in it. Their and expectations don't align with reality, yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't know if Tesla's doing enough to, I mean, you call it autopilot. <laughs> Although I guess, you know, the pilots out there are like, well, hey, hey bro, autopilot doesn't land the planes. <laughs> you know? Autopilot doesn't take on ramps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or in this case, catastrophically, doesn't take an on-ramp. <laughs> they did mention that, uh, according to the telemetry, the wheel had been telling him, hey, get your hands back on the wheel, or the car had been telling him. And he did not do that. I think it was six warnings. Yeah. I don't know how quickly it warns you over. I, probably pretty rapidly, because <laughs> it's a serious situation. So who knows? Maybe he was, like, he had a stroke or something. We're going to have one of those... Uh, like we're going to look back on this incident and it's going to be guys like this that ruin it for the rest of us because it's like after the third warning, the car will just start braking and stop completely until you put your wheels, your hands back on the wheel. I mean, but then you, you get rear ended. Yeah. Well, if you stop slowly, you might not, but you say guys like this, this is like 60% of people who are going to drive <laughs> Teslas. You, know? you give people like after they see it, they'll, they'll test it. They'll very gingerly be like, really? Will it drive itself? And they'll like take their hands off the wheel. And it's like, oh, and two minutes later, they have full faith in it. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about some other Tesla news that is decidedly not the driver's fault, but that will affect their stock prices? That is, Tesla is recalling 123,000 Model S sedans for a power steering problem. Not actually a problem with the power steering. It's a problem with the bolts that connect the power steering motor to the steering system. In areas where a lot of salt is used to clear ice from roadways, it can corrode the bo bolts prematurely and the power steering motor will break itself loose. But you can't still drive the car. You just won't have power steering. So it's not catastrophic, but uh, maybe if there's a weak old lady driving her <laughs> Tesla, 
could be lethal for that. I was so surprised I couldn't remember to hit the brakes. But you got to think as cheap as replacing a couple of bolts is going to be the logistics of the recall. It's going to come at a bad time for Tesla financially. Considering they're doing everything they possibly can to get those new, uh, the the cheaper model. What's it called? I can't even remember. Uh, model 3? I think so, yeah. And yeah. they're behind schedule on that. If they don't meet that quota, <laughs> it's going to be more investors like you know angrily selling the stock. So <laughs> Tesla had better be careful. Uh, Elon Musk will find himself Toys R Us if he is is not careful. So Twitch layoffs, uh, layoffs at Twitch. This is of course the big streaming company. In case you didn't know that, I feel like the our entire audience knows who Twitch is, but maybe not. Uh, layoffs have hit Twitch as the company readjusts some departments. By all accounts, it looks like it's less than 30 people, just sort of a reorganization. Uh, the article mentions that the guy that did the firing did it via Google Hangouts, which seems, seems kind of kind of silly. <laughs> they should have live-streamed it. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, it seems like they got rid of a lot of the community-type people. And a lot of those people are sort of lashing out and saying they got uh, amazon Because, of course, <laughs> Amazon acquired Twitch recently. That's 30 people, but I don't think they have a ton of employees. I think percentage-wise, that's... That's yeah, a significant con- percentage. Yeah, considerable. Maybe if there's anybody that works inside Twitch and in our audience, they could give us the inside scoop and also help us out. <laughs> <laughs> Verizon is going to begin charging you to pay your bill over the phone because it costs so much money to let people pay their bill over the phone. It's just so convenient. I can't imagine... So that's going to be what eight or seven dollars. Uh, T-Mobile charges eight, and AT&T charges five. But let's say a call center could process fifteen of those an hour. That seems reasonable, don't you think? Yeah. Let's say it's ten. So are you paying your call center workers seventy dollars an hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most people that call in, I think, have forgotten to pay, and they're not late yet. But because they can't pay quickly enough, they will be late by the time their mail-in payment gets there or whatever, which just seems silly. Yeah. That's, uh, that's just... Uh, the phone companies are notorious for the nickel and dime charges, <laughs> and they get away with it. So, Do you think maybe a phone company running a call center they ha- <laughs> might have less costs than the rest of us? Or that perhaps they already have people answering phones that could take care of this if it's fairly rare? Mm, I don't know. Uh, maybe a dollar, but seven seems... Uh, excessive. <laughs> well, change is afoot in industries. We often report about uh, disruptive technology changes in different industries. Well, here it is. Here is your high watermark for the TV ad industry. TV Growth in TV ad spending just turned negative. So the dollars are going to flow to other digital platforms. I would say that most advertisers have low confidence uh, in digital platforms, and traditional advertisers misunderstand what exactly digital platforms are going to deliver. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's less spending overall, but definitely this is ad apocalypse for TV stations. Well, and they're all sort of... The the cable cutters, they don't know how to deal with it, and they look at Netflix, and they look at Amazon, and they say, you know what, we need to get into that business. But if everybody gets into that business, it dissects the market too many ways. I don't think they even see it as we need to get into that business. I think they see it as... Those assholes have stolen from us what is rightfully ours. Yeah, we need to do yeah. everything that we can to shut them down and not embrace these new models. Kind of like the music industry who's been you know, clawing <laughs> at... Uh, uh, interestingly, the CD and, uh, uh, I guess, vinyl sales outpaced digital this, <laughs> like last month. Is that just nostalgia or is that just the, an industry uh, in death throes? I don't know. It's... <laughs> I, the streaming, I have gone completely to the online streaming music. Even though I know it's like, I don't own this, and one day they're just going to tell me I don't have it anymore, but it's so convenient. <laughs> well, it might be a little bit like this graph. I mean, if you look at this graph of spending, it's like, you know, vinyl sales went up. Maybe it's from this negative 1.5% to the 0.5%. Well, that little peak, though, in 2020 <laughs> is just because of uh, the Olympics and the next Donald Trump presidential campaign. <laughs> Like they've already predicted, it's like, well, they'll make money that year, <laughs> so because people really tuned in to both of those things this past year. I really want to know what happened in two thousand nine. Was that like a, another sort of like mini bubble crash? What's going that on? That was there? the financial crisis, like the housing crisis. Yeah, well, it affected everything. Uh, 
Yeah. So you can't afford your house, so you're not going to do any online advertising. Oh, you, you were canceling your cable so you could <laughs> afford to make your mortgage. <laughs> In other news, uh, Facebook has decided to, I don't know, what what's the spin they put on this? To reevaluate some of their privacy options so that people have more confidence in their privacy on the platform. Well, what they're doing is they saw the people, you know, what was it Zuckerberg said? He like, he didn't see a, a severe amount of people deleting Facebook. I don't know what the exact wording was, but something tells me that they did eventually see that if they hadn't already. And he was just lying. So they decided, well, we have to give them a way to, delete all this data that they now know that we know about them rather than just delete their account. So I think this is just triage. So yeah, this is, it's uh, the headline here on the Facebook newsroom is it's time to make our privacy tools easier to find. And you know what they're calling this? They're calling this, uh, let me see if I can hear new privacy shortcuts menu, the entirely not ironically named privacy shortcuts because they're taking shortcuts with your privacy. Oh wait, that's not what that means. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, they're giving you this, uh, make it more secure, delete what we've already got, make it so that your friends can't get certain information, even if they have these apps permissions and stuff like that. <laughs> Basically something that it should have existed the entire time. I find it hard to believe that they'll really stop collecting data though, because it really is the only way they make money. No. And also a little bit later in the news, we'll see that some people have also started to use this download your data feature on other platforms like Google. And of course, Google has a lot of information too. So brace for the freak out in the coming weeks. I'm sure that those stories are going to dominate our, <laughs> our news feed and the news from us as it's like, you know, journalists discovers they can download their data from Facebook or from Google just as easily as Facebook. And then the ensuing freak out. But you know, based on the, people that I've talked to and a lot of the comments on the other videos we did, a lot of people sort of made that excuse. It's like, well, yeah, I know about Facebook, but my grandma uses it. And she gets mad if I don't like her (laughs) post or my friends only want to use the messenger and I have to do that to stay in touch. So if you're one of those people, I guess this is good news. You can go and delete all the stuff they've ever stored. Although they don't always delete things because yeah, they're like, not going to delete. <laughs> some people deleted some videos and when they downloaded all their stuff, all the videos they deleted were still on the stuff that Facebook had on file. So that seems, yeah. like, seems like an oops. So I pretend to delete it. I don't know. Maybe it'll make you feel better. My favorite thing about this blog post is the road ahead. It's our responsibility to tell you how we collect and use your data in language that's detailed, but also easy to understand. Well, no, that's not. We will stop collecting your data. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like, isn't that com- like, what changed? Like, this is this is like we're gonna do something different here. It seems like that's tantamount to an admission that they were deliberately obfuscating things. So they still got their hand in your pocket, but now there's a velvet glove. <laughs> Whoa! Speaking of the delete Facebook campaign, Playboy, yeah, the, the the men's magazine, I guess they're deleting all their Facebook stuff. And it was, uh, I didn't really think about it, but this actually is a theme that we're gonna see in in our other, in some of our other stories. The uh, Hugh Hefner's, what is his son, Cooper Hefner? I imagine. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, son of the late Hugh Hefner uh, called Facebook sexually repressive on Twitter. And it's like, you know, in the desire to connect people and not piss people off, like piss everybody off, talking about sexuality is definitely one of the sort of taboo things because it's like if you are not aligned with somebody else or you're not tolerant, then that would piss you off. And so they want to not have anything like that on their platform because it would uh, disengage people from other people. I think there's a little more to this, though, in terms of uh, Playboy is, I don't know if they turned it around. I kind of doubt it, but they had to sell the mansion. Yeah. Like they're in bad shape. So I think they were like, oh, can we get a little publicity here? (laughs) Yes. We will delete Facebook. <laughs> and they're not wrong. I'm sure Facebook is sexually repressive and reprehensible in a number of ways. And you should delete Facebook. But I kind of think they were just looking for a head. Right, riding the buzz yeah. bandwagon. <laughs> well, uh, kind of related to that on the business side of things, there have been a number of memos and internal communications that have leaked out of Facebook. And so Facebook is having sort of an allergic reaction to their own leaks. One of the leaks is from one of their executive team. And it's like, you know... The BuzzFeed News here has put 
put the quotes at the top and it's sort of weird, but it's like, so we can connect more people. It's like, that can be bad if they make it negative. Maybe someone dies in a terrorist attack coordinated on our tools and we still connect people. Uh, you know, anything that allows us to connect more people more often is de facto good. And so a lot of the language in this memo from 2016 seems in direct opposition to the we want to give you tools to control your stuff in the blog post. Like the specific language in here from this executive about uh, having lang He doesn't come right out and say, let's use misleading language, but he's like, we want to make sure that people can still connect even when they set their privacy options. So let's use some language that, that uh, will still make people searchable. Like that's in this memo, which seems to be against the simpler privacy tools, the privacy shortcuts, if you will, of, the, of their blog post. Now, this guy's not there anymore, and they, Zuckerberg has already sort of denounced it and said he didn't agree with it at the time. <laughs> but also, Do you also believe in the Easter Bunny? I mean, when you read this, you get this impression that this guy, because in the corporate world, it's kind of common where it's like people write up these memos and they feel it's like I, I, I would think about they think in their mind it's sort of like, uh, Braveheart giving the warrior poet speech, you know, <laughs> at the end. Because they think, oh, man, I'm really going to fire up the troops and they're going to be. And so this guy, the theme of this thing, which he says he didn't really mean, I don't, I don't know how, is like we connect people no matter what. That is our <laughs> God-given, uh, you know, we've, we've, been, we've been commanded from on high. We must <laughs> connect people no matter the cost. We're going to connect those ISIS terrorists with ISIS sympathizers across the globe. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> and if, if there's a suicide bombing, well, we can't help that because connecting people is what we do and we will do it no matter what. And it seems like that's what they did. <laughs> of course, I feel like the connecting really was more about advertisers and your data rather than you and your distant relatives. You know, I was trying to figure out how to attack some of the language in that memo for exactly that reason, because uh, at one point he says something like, uh, you know, it was like, we, we know that we've got true analytics when people make these types of connections based on what they discuss and what they're doing together. We know that the analytical data is true. And there, it, it seems like there would be many layers to that statement. I don't want to read too much into it, but knowing what Facebook does and knowing that its business is advertising, that's a kind of a sinister line. And it might also be that people that work at Facebook are, you know, they're not stupid, or at least not all of them. These are technically gifted people for the most part, and they're kind of going to see through a lot of the bullshit. So maybe... You give them something like this, and it's sort of like, well, just ignore all the terrible things we're doing because it's for this greater good. <laughs> and never mind that that really just puts money in our pocket because we're connecting people. Well, it's uh, it was surprising for Facebook employees in another way in that Facebook is usually super, super secretive, like almost cult-like secrecy is how I would characterize it. So uh, Business Insider has a pretty good article here that where they explore that uh, a lot of Facebook's Facebook employees are in, in disbelief that this memo was leaked in the first place. And so now they're starting to think, like, do we have spies among our ranks? Uh, what's going on with that? And it's created another article in Fortune that said that uh, Facebook employees are reportedly deleting all their controversial internal messages like this memo, just even messages between themselves. <laughs> Don't they know that nothing ever really gets deleted? I mean, it's going to look really bad if there's an investigation. <laughs> of all people, they should know. Yeah, so I, I think there is uh, some fear that they might be, this could be like the scarlet letter in the technology industry. Right? Yeah. It's like, oh, you worked at Facebook? I'm not sure if you're a fit here because <laughs> you let that madman do whatever he wanted and we can't take that risk. <laughs> That would be an interesting ethical turnaround if you think about it. I mean, do do we think that this type of incident will drive enough outrage among the general public that that kind of thing will happen? Or is Facebook really the scapegoat? Is it really the case that not just the Amazon and Microsofts of the world uh, and the Googles of the world are mining this data, but literally every tiny company, like every tiny app developer is is mining as much data as possible to the point that there are you know, hundreds or thousands of companies that you interact with on a daily basis. And all of them are eager to mine as much data as possible from the beginning. And so it sort of becomes a game of 
it's not really Scarlet. It's like, it would be like the Scarlet Letter if everybody were committing adultery and they were the only person that got caught. And most people are. There's another way to look at this, I think, might be the ideology in Silicon Valley has gone to that crazy, like nearly communist level. You read a lot about that. And it could be that a lot of these people were totally on the Kool-Aid. You know, the, the Bosworth Kool-Aid's like, well, you know what? It's okay that we're doing all these things because we are connecting people. We're fighting the good fight. And look at all the great things we're doing. And, and then they find out it's like, wait, we got Trump elected? <laughs> and that sort of broke the spell. And now you get leakers because, you know, it's a, they're not willing to uh, drink the Kool-Aid anymore. It is, it is interesting how... I don't, partisanship, partisanship doesn't seem the right way to describe the things because on the political side of the things, it seems like that partisanship from that part of people's lives is spilling over into other things. I don't think that I've ever seen as much divisive, just vitriol in the technical, in the technology industry, even for just things about like which GPU brand, which CPU brand, which, you know, who's your, who's your home team. I don't, I don't really understand what the source of all the vitriol is. Oh, I think it's a mastery of the advertising and the media to create that dissent because it's like a sporting event. You know, as long as, as if people watch sports games where there's a big rivalry more than they watch sports games where it's just a friendly competition. Hmm. So if everything in your life down to your GPU card is an intense rivalry then you'll be more passionate about it. You'll be more engaged. Well, does it go then without saying that that level of passion, that level of emotional investment will cloud your clear thinking and logical judgment? <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think there's a lot of empirical evidence. Yeah. I think we're seeing a lot of that. So when you have people that are reporting on these kinds of things, trying to drive as much outrage and, outrage and clickbait as possible, you, you lose all ability to have any kind of civil, logical discourse about what's going on, whether or not this is good for society, or how any of this actually works. Because none of that matters. What matters is making money and <laughs> selling data. <laughs> Yay, capitalism! Uh, switching gears a little bit. Uh, Microsoft has decided to ban offensive language from Skype, Xbox, Office, and other services. This headline is slightly misleading, maybe? But maybe not. I don't know. Well, I don't... Banned. It's like, how do you enforce that? Is someone constantly watching? And I don't think that's the case. But it is still terrifying because they say that if there's an incident, they do reserve the right to review what happened. <laughs> meaning that they're keeping track of everything. Well, my heart goes out to all my homies in Fort Gay, West Virginia. It's going to be a real tough time for you guys filling out your online profile. <laughs> and some of those Asian names, you know. <laughs> but yeah, they talk about uh, Xbox actually, I guess, already had this policy. Although, now, now I don't use the Xbox anymore. But I remember back in the, like the original Xbox and the Xbox 360 days. It's, it's not possible that kids have gotten any more. I mean, we play PUBG. <laughs> and, I mean, Powerful, realistic portrayal of mental illness in that chat. That uh, in that pl the plane waiting to jump out of the plane in PUBG is basically a clan rally. <laughs> you know, it's funny though because this isn't the first time Microsoft has done this with Xbox Live. One of the other times that Microsoft did this was, I think it, it was almost 10 years ago. And actually, Fort Gay, West Virginia was one of the places they banned. There's a really hilarious news article story about, about a guy that lived in Fort Gay. And he had his Microsoft account and his Microsoft service suspended. And he called customer service and they were like, there is no way that you live in Fort Gay. And so he gave them the zip code, which is like 25514 or something. And then they were like, well, I, just, I can't help you, sir. This is not, we're not, we just, we, we just don't really care. <laughs> so at Microsoft had, like, between then and now, Microsoft has reverse policy and they allow you to express your sexual orientation now like that's an okay thing to do so listen up trolls you can take that to the nth degree and it's just going to run roughshod over whatever non-offensive policy that they were trying to do here like facebook microsoft was trying to make it so that somebody won't be offended looking at somebody else's stuff and so since they allow you to advertise your, your sexual orientation, you know, if you want to identify as an attack helicopter or whatever and fill that out, as long as you don't push the ridiculousness too much, trolls can have a field day with that 
and completely, utterly defeat the whole no offensive thing. The other thing they talk about here is nudity. So if you're Skyping some hot, you know, nudes to each other, <laughs> apparently I, that might be reviewed, which I didn't even think was what yeah. historically was not possible, but the protocol has been changed. So I think basically what Microsoft did is they changed the terms of service to make it so that they can do whatever they want. Yeah. And somebody found that out and sort of looked at the scope of it. And like you say, it's probably blown out of proportion, but not necessarily because this is all in the realm of possibility, even yeah. if it isn't happening right now. How crazy would it be if you, you know, you travel back in time and it's like, we're going to invent the telephone, but the telephone can decide what you can and can't have conversations about. I'm not sure I want to put the, the, whether or not I can have those decisions or those conversations in corporate hands. You're basically describing China. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it seems more as time goes on it just seems like more and more two sides of the same coin maybe this is to do with like international like international law and international law compliance maybe this this is, will make people like try well, to feel better about xbox live some people did say that they thought maybe it had something to do with uh the fosta sesta stuff because oh yeah it, they could if they even have an idea that something like that's going down, then they have the ability to just shut you down and you already agreed to it in the terms of service. That would be disturbing. It's like there's a there's a case that we report on a year from now about a sex trafficking ring that did all their meetings and stuff over Skype. I mean... Or Xbox Live. <laughs> See, it's going to be like those stories, those fake news stories that circulated during the whole, the first like terrorist crisis where like terrorists were, were organizing themselves in CSGO by shooting certain patterns of bullets on the wall, which was entirely fake news. But, you know, the, the freak out and outrage, of course, was real because, hey, it was driving clicks. So yeah. what you do is you, uh, you know, you, you map real world targets to PUBG locations <laughs> and then they're playing. You're like, all right, we're going to drop at this location. And that starts the mission. Pachinki is Las Cruces, New Mexico. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So Mozilla is doing something really interesting and really cool. This is this almost reminds me of like the Mozilla of the days of yore because you know like Brian Lunduk and some other people have been really critical of some stuff that Mozilla has done lately. What they've done is they've created a new extension that isolates your Facebook data. So you know how on every website on earth there's a like button, like as if somebody will ever click that. Those social media interaction buttons, those are spying on you. That's one of the ways that Google or that Google that Facebook gets all of its intelligence on you. This plugin from Mozilla wraps up all of that into its own little sandbox so it can't tell who you are. This is, it's a cool thing, but at the same time, it's sort of like you are still feeding the monster. You know, you're just, you're just wearing protective clothing while you're doing it. You're like wearing the beekeeper suit to extract the poison. So you're well, wearing a beekeeper suit while attacking hornets. Yeah, you should delete Facebook, but if you absolutely must have it, I guess this is a fine way to... At least they won't be able to follow you everywhere else that you go. They will only be able to track what you explicitly give them. They've actually gotten in legal trouble in the EU for tracking you when you're logged out. So presumably that happens everywhere else. This should prevent that. So this is. I wonder how much of this is good job Mozilla looking out for the awesomeness of citizenry and how much of it is... Let's jump on that PR bandwagon. Yeah, it's exactly that. <laughs> you know, it's it. They saw it's like oh, let's kick Facebook while they're down <laughs> and score points with our people. And I, we should also mention that if you have the Facebook app on your phone, just uninstall it. This is ridiculous. Set it on fire. Yeah, this is like <laughs> this is like putting the condom on afterwards. It's, <laughs> After you're at home by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. uh. Also, uh, making the news, and the, the Daily Mail, there's there have actually been several articles, and I don't know why I picked the Daily Mail article as the best one, because look at this, look, look oh. at this craziness that we're having to <laughs> endure. This is repulsive. This is just, I, I'm clicking close, and nothing's happened, and now I've clicked on the wrong tab. It's just, oh, it's just uh, so you frustrating. Know what? We, could, we could just do this one without the, <laughs> the... The idea is very simple. So everybody who downloaded everything about Facebook was like, oh my God, look at everything they know about me. That is literally a drop in a bucket compared to what Google knows. Google knows infinitely more about you than Facebook ever did. Literally everything. So you can download your data from Google and see exactly what they've got on you. And you will be disturbed. So you should totally yeah. go do that. This article explains how. 
any file that you've put on Google Drive, even if you deleted it, still there. All of your location tracking, if you carried your Android phone with you, all of it, everything, even the time between locations and like, you know, whether or not there was traffic, <laughs> they know everything. It's incredible. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, is Google going to be on the end of like the freak out now? Or I, is, is this an elaborate uh, campaign by Facebook to shift the blame? I don't think so. And here's why. And this will answer this question because most of the outrage had nothing to do with Facebook. It had to do with Trump and mm. the fact that the they think this changed the election. Google is still presumably in that sort of liberal safe zone because mm -hmm. they're, they're very much on that side. So it's okay if they have horrible superpowers and they spy on everything if they agree with us politically. So That is a weird position to be in. Yeah. Like Again, I think that people's emotion there, the whole red versus blue, is clouding logical and clear thinking because this should not be anything that anyone has. But I'll tell you, and I don't, of course, you know, politically, I'm, I'm neither way. But I do, after reading that, I'm like, ooh, Google's definitely got a lot of stuff about me. Am I going to stop using it? And I don't think I am because <laughs> it is really super convenient. I like my phone and I use Gmail. And so it is, I, I guess I can't preach too hard against the Facebook people in light of this. Oh, that should be good. So speaking of cloud services that are shutting down, even amid Google announcing that they're discontinuing goo.gl, Amazon has announced that their music storage service will remove your MP3 files on April 30th. I don't really think that's enough notice, but okay. <laughs> but this is this what they're actually doing seems super confusing. Did I read this right? It's like if you just go check check a box, it's going to move your MP3s from this to some other Amazon cloud yeah, service. Yeah, they've got I think if you have Amazon Music, they let you upload your own songs. Because Google Music does that to a certain extent. And you can, I think you can convert to that from the locker, whatever the locker was. But in the locker, they're only deleting MP3s. But if you bought your MP3s from Amazon, they're not affected. So hmm. it's very convoluted, this story. It might be, this might almost be nothing. Like I don't use these services, but this might all just be some a headline for The Verge. I don't know. But if you do have an Amazon locker and you have MP3s... Anybody want to forward us the actual email? Because <laughs> Please save them. What? This is a... It's like the cloud. It's like eventually somebody... Someday, someday somebody turns that off. So why? Yeah, it's like the Google Music. Like I've just accepted that I've stopped building my music collection for myself. And someday it's going away. <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, I don't know. I don't know what I'll do. There's a there's a C level executive in a room somewhere that is that is like someday you will pay some amount of money for us not to do that. And whether that's a dollar or five hundred dollars, <laughs> we will find out what your amount is. I'm already paying them eight dollars a month. <laughs> They're just gonna slow. It's like a boiling frog. It's like it's, it's like the cable bill. It's like I'm gonna get thirteen dollar a month cable internet service, and then five years later, it's like Jesus, I'm paying two hundred dollars a month for cable. What is wrong with me? It'll be like that. I feel somewhat vindicated in that, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's sort of like a, you know, it's like time dilation. For me, music just keeps getting worse and worse. So <laughs> I don't care about newer music. Uh, Amazon did not have a good week this week either in terms of their stock prices, kind of like Tesla, because Trump has slammed Amazon for causing tremendous loss to the U.S. He It was a series of angry tweets because... Well, Trump doesn't seem to communicate any other way than, than <laughs> by tweets. He kind of doubled down on this again today, although it was <laughs> overshadowed by something else that he said. He pointed out the post office thing, and a lot of people have sort of, like, you know, fact-checked that. And they're saying, well, on the surface, it definitely looks like the post office is making money from yeah. Amazon, not losing money, but... Yeah, I've actually, I did a lot of research on the post office thing. Amazon pays our postal service a bunch of money for a lot of special treatment. But Amazon actually, like, the post office has to have that infrastructure there anyway, like the delivery trucks and stuff. And so one study was, was saying that unless Amazon paid the postal service, they wouldn't have to have delivery trucks and all this other kind of stuff. So if you look at it that way... The post office is losing money on Amazon services. But if you look at the post office as also making money on other letter deliveries and things, then suddenly the post office is cash flow positive because all of that infrastructure 
that Amazon pays for that they make a slight loss on, they make profit on everything else they do. So depending on how you want to cut that enchilada, it, you can make it look like it's not profitable or you can make it look like it's, it actually has a huge profit. The other really weird thing about the post office is the pension plan for the post office is structured in like a super weird way that the, the post office has to pay a crazy amount of money from their profits into like their employee retirement plans. And no other company in America, like no other private company in America has to do it that way. And that's one, that's one reason that the pro, the post office struggles financially. And so I just, I don't feel like we could get that into a tweet ever. So the limited, the, the possibilities for, for explanation could be limited now in terms of like outsourcing and stuff. Okay. Maybe, but the post office thing is a, is no, is a non-story I think. So that makes, that makes me question everything else here. The one, the thing he's really pissed off about is the Washington post because the Washington post is as left leaning as a publication can get. And Bezos owns that. And it's, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like the, uh, and the Fox news at its worst, just polarized turned you know, the, the <laughs> flip side of that coin. And of course, they hate Trump and he hates them. And I think there's also a little bit of jealousy because, of course, uh, I don't know if it's still true after it because the, the stock did suffer from this. But Bezos, once again, became the world's richest man. <laughs> and we know that Trump is petulant <laughs> and he's also very rich. So I think a little bit was like, oh, you're going to be the world's richest man. Let me show you what real power is, Bezos. You know? <laughs> like, there's a little bit of that. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if part of the reason that, like this would be amazing. Like if Bezos really is Lex Luthor, we find out later that the current administration was set up by Bezos to make it seem more palatable to have Bezos as president. You definitely. <laughs> when you talk about the, you know, the partisanship. Yeah. And there is a, a non-trivial number of people in this country who are like, Trump's against it. I'm for it. You know, it doesn't matter what it is, and there's no critical looking at it. It's just. If if Trump if Trump doesn't like it, then it must be the best thing ever. In other news this week, Amazon has severed ties with top lobbying firms in Washington, and this is this is apparently because of the uh, uh, they they lost out on the tax overhaul stuff, so they're they're getting a different lobbying group. I well, didn't, I didn't that really follow Trump. One of Trump's campaign promises was that he was going to go after him for taxes, and I'm sure it's true that. Amazon gets away with murder on the tax front. <laughs> but it's true of all the big tech companies, really. I mean, nobody's paying their share of taxes. But because of this personal vendetta he has against <laughs> them, they're, I don't think the lobbyists are getting the job done. You know, like they can't. How do you fight against a president who just hates you, you know, hates the CEO and wants to hurt him any way he can? So they're getting a new batch of lobbyists. They also ramped up their lobbying to an insane amount and uh, didn't get anything for their, their dollars. Well, one theory that I have as to why Trump is so pissed off with Jeff Bezos is because Trump is secretly a uh, sexy erotic novel author because Amazon is, is sending the sexy erotic novel authors to the no rank dungeon. So if you want a bestseller, the erotic books are no longer going to be counted. I wonder if Fifty Shades of Grey will count. You, you would, it would be so easy to identify if Trump was ghostwriting erotic <laughs> novels because he would describe the genitalia with so many superlatives. You know, it's like the biggest, most tremendous, <laughs> <laughs> the most pulsating. We should have saved this story for the nonsense <laughs> section. <laughs> so I was surprised by this story that I've never thought about this, but there's like romance erotic and soft erotic and then erotica. And these are all categorized differently. In the Amazon store. So it's like, well, maybe you don't want full penetration in your erotic novel. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's a, uh, one of the, and I think it's, uh, you know, like some of those, like the, the housewife romance novels, you know, where it's racy, but it's not like pornographic, but then you can go all the way to the other side. So there, these people are saying they were getting improperly tagged and it was ruining their business because it actually took them off the bestseller list if yeah. they were in the, erotica category yeah and uh there is an update from amazon which was very cryptic which says that uh amazon provided motherboard with the following statement a recent kindle store change inadvertently affected the display of sales rank for some titles we have corrected this issue but there's there's no other details like 
what so I guess Fifty Shades of Grey is okay, but some of the other stuff is not okay. I don't. I don't. I don't know where you draw the line. And also, uh, the story is great because one of the authors described uh, an alien. Uh, it was a book about aliens where there were purple penises and ejaculate flavored like candied lavender. <laughs> But it didn't get flagged. Like that one was okay, and then she had one that was based on humans, and it got and it got flagged. Got taken off the bestseller list. Well, honestly, none of that sounds worse than Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, I've not, I've neither watched the movie nor read the book, <laughs> but uh, I think that one probably does count toward like the romantic because there's a there's a love story there, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's not just. I mean, are there really? <laughs> Are there really novels where it's just pure sex depiction and there's no like there's rip no, your inbox? There's no exposition. <laughs> oh, uh, don't well, don't waste my time. Yeah, let's yeah. just get right to it. <laughs> I think that's probably enough business news for this episode. So uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, what do we got? What do we got lined up for the rest of the week? Not next week. Next week. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. What have, what have we got lined up for the rest of the week? What, what's the what's the what's the breakdown of stories? Oh, I've got it here somewhere. Uh, the next one, the next episode of the news is going to be policy, crypto, and security. And our episode of the news for Friday is going to be AI, robots, hardware, gaming, and nonsense. So you got that to look forward to. Of course, you can have it right now if you join on Patreon. So it's all good. <laughs> not, not to be pushy or anything. But. <laughs> all right, we'll see you guys later, and thank you. Mm-hmm.